welcome to a new series of videos in the book of 1 Timothy. I'm hoping to be working through this book for the first few months of this year and I hope that you can join us for the journey through this book. If you are new to this channel then I do encourage you to subscribe, like this video, share it with others if you think others would find this helpful. Um, and every time I preach a different section through 1 Timothy, God willing, I will be posting a video like this just to show some of my working uh, to help you to get into the different sections in this book. And for this first section of chapter 1, I called the section Defend the Truth. I've called the series in 1 Timothy, God's Priorities for His People. And that is one of the big things that we see throughout this letter. Paul is writing to Timothy, who is leading a church in a place called Ephesus. And Paul had been with this church, you can read in Acts chapter 18 and 19 and chapter 20. He goes and visits the elders in Ephesus again in, in Acts. And then he wrote his letter to the church in Ephesus um, a few years after being with them, or quite soon probably after being with them. And things were going really well. They were a really flagship church, but then things started to go wrong. And that is why Paul has written this uh, letter to Timothy. And one of the key things that really is at the heart of this letter that shows us God's priorities for his people is that he is a God who saves. Uh, God wants this church to keep uh, this message of salvation uh, right in the forefront of everything that they do. And we see this at a few different places in the letter. In the next section that we'll look at in chapter 1 verse 15, we see this key verse, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And then in the next chapter, in chapter 2, uh, we see Paul saying that God our Savior, again, wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. And then a little later in chapter 4, we see Paul says, we have put our hope in the living God who is the Savior of all people and especially of those who believe. So this idea of salvation, uh, seeing sinners saved, is right at the heart of this letter of 1 Timothy. And this is what Paul wanted this church in Ephesus to keep as their main, one of their main priorities, to make sure that they continued to see sinners saved. And the opening of the letter shows this to us. We're introduced to the key characters. So Paul is writing this. He's writing it to his son in the faith, Timothy, who is leading the church in Ephesus. And a few things that we see uh, repeated through this section is that Paul says that he is an apostle of Christ Jesus. He calls Christ Jesus our hope. And he mentions our Lord Jesus. And he wants to keep the gospel of our Lord Jesus uh, right at the center of uh, everything that he, he writes in this letter. Just looking at uh, key repetition, which is always a good tool to use when you come to any passage. And a, a key idea that comes up over and over again in the whole letter is Paul speaking about uh, faith. Um, he speaks about advancing God's work, which is by faith. Is that they have a, a sincere faith and uh, the same root word is underneath this word for entrusted um, so faith is to trust in something and this gospel uh, the glorious gospel has been entrusted to Paul and he in turn later on uh, he says he entrusts this to Timothy and he wants him to entrust it to others who will uh, continue this work now right at the heart of this passage is verse 5. Paul speaks of a command which we'll look at in a moment and he says the goal of this command is love. Uh, so he gives us kind of uh, an aim right at the, the beginning of this letter and the goal of this command is love which comes from so the love comes from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. Now, where does a pure heart come from? Because by nature, our hearts are sinful. God tells us uh, throughout Scripture that our hearts are 
uh, idol factories, they're sinful, our consciences aren't good, they are uh, tainted, uh, we are weighed down by guilt, our consciences uh, remind us of how rebellious we are. Um, so we don't have pure hearts, we don't have good consciences, and our faith often isn't placed in the right things. So how do we get this love? He says it comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Those things are only possible for us if we have been saved. God our Savior. So if God has saved us and we've placed our hope in Jesus, if this glorious gospel has transformed us, then our lives are transformed. We are given pure hearts. Our consciences are cleared. Our faith has been placed in the right place which will lead to lives of love. This is the Greek word agape. Um, it is a self-sacrificial, other person-centered love that comes from the transformation that happens in those who have been saved by God. Now, as I said, I called this section Defend the Truth. And the truth needed to be defended because uh, false teachers had come in who are teaching uh, false doctrines uh, so they are contrary to the sound doctrine and in this letter Paul is going to be uh, reinforcing what is sound doctrine what is truth what is the truth that we should base our lives on um, and over and over again he's going to come back to this point the truth that God saves and transforms people he does that so that they will be marked by love and this truth needs to be defended so that God's work will advance. Um, the advancement of God's work is also a very important um, theme right at the beginning of this letter. So Paul is setting a foundation for the book uh, for us in this section. Um, he wants everything that happens in this church to conform to the glorious gospel uh, of the blessed God. Uh, I think that is a better translation of this. Uh, so rather than that conforms with the gospel concerning the glory of God, I think a better translation is that conforms to the glorious gospel of the blessed God. The, and that glorious gospel had been entrusted to Paul. And these false teachers were coming in and they were teaching things that were contrary to the sound doctrine about this glorious gospel. And we see Paul highlights a few of the things. Uh, he says uh, certain people have come in. And he's going to speak about those uh, certain people uh, throughout the book in different ways. Uh, and he says some very massive accusations against them. Um, he says they, they are teaching false doctrines. They've devoted themselves to myths and endless genealogies. And he says the result, such things promote controversial speculation. So they're teaching things that are confusing people, they are leading people away from the truth, and Paul says, command them not to, command them to stop. And he again, on the other side, so sandwiching verse 5, he's saying they have departed. Uh, to depart there uh, means to deviate or to swerve or to wander away. So it's as if they were going on the right path and they deviated and they carried on down that wrong path and they've turned to meaningless talk. Uh, it's empty talk. Uh, direct translation of that uh, Greek word could be uh, lots of words with no content. So it's empty, like a bubble. If you pop it, there's nothing there. So they've departed from the sound doctrine. They've departed from this message of God, our Savior, who transforms lives, who gives pure hearts, good consciences, uh, who, who our faith should be in. And when God does that work of transformation, it's seen in our lives of love. But he says they've departed from that. He says they want to be teachers of the law. And this is... Uh, something that he highlights a number of times. He gives a, a correct understanding of how we should use the law. So if you just look for uh, the repetition of the law here, he says they want to be teachers of the law. Now he's talking about 
um, Moses law, the Old Testament law. So they, they are insiders. They're not teaching something that's uh, completely separate from uh, the foundational truths of our faith. But they're teaching it in a way that's wrong because he says they want to be teachers of the law, but they don't know what they're talking about. They don't know what they so confidently affirm. They push their point powerfully because they're doing it confidently, but they actually don't know what they're talking about. But then Paul says, we know. So he's going to give it a, a true understanding of how to use the law, because there is a way to properly use the law. This H here is important. We know that the law is good. So Paul's not saying that we must check the law out. He's saying the law is good if you use it properly. And then he explains in verses 9, 10, and 11 how to properly use the law. And if you dig into this section, he's showing that the proper use of the law is to expose sinfulness. Because the law shows us God's perfect standards. And as we dig into God's perfect standards, we realize that we can't live up to those standards. And so the law just exposes our sinfulness. And as we properly teach the law, showing people that they can't achieve God's perfect standards, it then shows our need for a savior. It shows that we can't place our hope in uh, obeying these laws perfectly. Rather, we need to place our hope in Christ Jesus, our hope. And Paul focuses in on some specific sins that kind of line up with the second half of uh, the Ten Commandments. So where we are called to um, obey your father and mother, uh, these kill their father and mother. So that's lining up with uh, Exodus 20 verse 12. Uh, for murderers, again, Exodus 20 verse 13. For sexually immoral, so do not commit adultery. So the sexually immoral and those practicing uh, homosexuality. Uh, they are disobeying or they're violating Exodus 20 verse uh, 14. Um, slave traders. Uh, so this is people um, who, who uh, steal people. So it's do not steal. And so they are stealing people and selling people. So they are violating Exodus 20 verse 15. Um, liars do not lie. Um, perjurers, it's also lying, so that's um, Exodus 20, verse 16. So he goes for some specific uh, sins that they break, but then he also goes for general uh, uh, catch-all categories. So lawbreakers and rebels, ungodly, sinful, unholy, irreligious. And if we're honest and we use the law properly, all of us fall into these categories. If you go and read Jesus teaching where he says you've heard that it says do not murder but I tell you if you think hateful thoughts about your brother you've murdered him in your heart so all of us are more murderers and that's what the law does if we use it properly it shows us that we're all sinful we've all fallen short of God's perfect standards and we desperately need a savior and so that's what Paul is saying in here defend this truth defend this truth about our need for a savior and command those who are teaching false doctrines to stop. They're devoting themselves to myths and endless genealogies where we have the truth. So devote yourself to the truth because those things promote controversial speculation. But the truth about God our savior and Christ Jesus our hope, that truth advances God's work. It's that, that truth that we need to make known. And so that is what Paul is doing in this opening section. He's laying the foundation. He's saying we need to defend the truth, this truth that God saves and transforms people, that he causes them to be people who loves, who, who love others like he loves. And as we defend that truth, uh, we will be working to advance God's work, which is by faith. Now, as we come to a passage like this, and as you teach it to others, as you think about it, uh, we need to think seriously about what are the potential dangers, the, the false doctrines that are creeping in. We want to make sure that we are teaching the sound doctrine that conforms with the glorious gospel. And there are lots of things that creep in um, in our society. Increasingly, there are things 
uh, that that deviates, that departs from the truth. And so we need to be thinking, what are those dangers? And how do we protect ourselves from those dangers? Well, we need to know the truth. We need to know this glorious truth about God, our Savior, what it means to be saved, what it means to live transformed lives, and how we should be increasingly transforming to be more and more like Jesus. And then we need to be praying and asking God to help us that we might be among those who advance his work rather than are uh, devoted to wrong things or promoting controversial speculation. We need to be among those who are advancing God's work. So pray that God would help you to be among those who do that all for his glory's sake. And I pray that you, as you dig in further, that this passage will challenge your own heart, that it would rem remind you of the truth, that it would remind you that God, our Savior, if you've been saved by him, your heart has been purified, your conscience has been cleansed because you have a genuine faith in him. And you'll know if that's true or not by the fact that is love something that characterizes your life? A love for him and love for others as you advance God's work of making God our Savior known and telling people about Christ Jesus, our hope. Well, God bless as you dig in further.